Welcome to the Palestine Podcast, produced by the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Well, welcome everyone to this um, lovely opportunity to hear Bernard talk about his work and his research, but for all of us to discuss uh, what solidarity means in terms of retrieving and recording and remembering and conveying the Palestinian tragedy and story accurately and as a core part of what it means to give solidarity. And our people all over the country that go and explore and learn about the Palestinian story. Many people have become interested again in, our, in, the, in the entire British Empire and the colonial stories and bringing them into our schools. And I would say that there's nothing more important and central to that education is Palestinian history. And that's because, as Bernard I know will be talking about, it's the direct connection and reason why people in this country, above all, need to be engaged and need to, there's an outstanding debt, colonial, it's with other countries, it's a legacy. It's what they've left behind, which is still present. With us, it's a living settler colonialism. And by people's knowledge and activity, uh, they can raise awareness of this. And that's what will make the difference. Why do people, I mean, everyone has seen uh, the attacks on those who give solidarity with Palestine. And I would say the best answer to that is to convey that history and why people in Britain must struggle until Palestine is free. It is Britain that took our sovereignty away as Palestinians. And so there's an especial obligation here to keep campaigning and to make sure that the generations before uh, are remembered, those who struggled, but also those in Britain that were making policy that did take our country away from us and denied us our right of self-determination. And I think the idea of that we have a moment to reflect on how do we continue to convey this story and not because at the moment they're, they're, they're trying to bury it. They're taking a lot of the material out of the archives in Israel so that the history of the Nakba, but Bernard's going to actually talk about some very important, the very important decades during the mandate period. And I think that is what people have to think about uh, conveying because it, it also brings the responsibility to, for solidarity. So with that, uh, I'd like to ask you to, to, to start off on this, this terrible but critical history. Thanks. Thank you very much, Karma, and thank you for that introduction. I want to talk in this section about the Britain's legacy in Palestine to give a kind of general uh, overview, and I'll try and touch on some of the comments that, that um, Karma has made about kind of work in this area. But one of the things I want to kind of start off by saying is that I think that the campaign in terms of Palestine rights is very much linked in to the sentiments and the politics that have been expressed in the Black Lives Matter campaign because what is coming very much to the fore in that is a recognition of the distorted character of the history that is taught in schools in Britain and the education politically that we receive, the kind of mythologizing of the role of the empire. We even have some historians who think that the empire was an entirely positive thing, that in actual fact, what it did was it enhanced people's lives in countries like India and elsewhere. Uh, and they fail to recognize, indeed refuse to recognize, in my view, the absolutely atrocious, calamitous consequences of the empire and what it actually meant for people living there. I mean, just as one kind of indicator, and we're talking about Palestine, I know, but it, it's something which is very much kind of coming to the fore. And that is the role, for example, of Winston Churchill in India and the famine in Bengal, which he was uh, instrumental in uh, bringing about, which led to the loss of more than 4 million lives in India, something which is glossed over in terms of uh, talking about history. And it's one of the many kind of features that I think it's important that we actually restore the truth uh, and acknowledge what did happen. So that is what I want to talk about in relation to Palestine. What was the situation? Because very, very clearly, the consequences of that 
live through to today's experience for the Palestinian people and remain a massive challenge. In, in, in my view, the Palestinians have had to face three separate empires, if you like. Uh, in, in the beginning, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the British Empire, and to, in very large measure, uh, the United States Empire. Uh, all of those, I think, have been uh, actually uh, critical to kind of shaping and forming how the Palestinians could uh, seek to establish their rights and fight for their lives, for their rights uh, and, and campaign. And people talk about colonialism as something kind of quite distant. But of course, uh, <laughs> colonialism and imperialism are two sides of the same coin. And I think one of the things that I would like to say at the outset is that people need to have an appreciation of the scale of the actual nature of British imperialism at the beginning in 1917 when the British occupied Palestine and what happened. The British Empire was absolutely colossal. As you can see from this map, I hope, it covered nearly a quarter of the globe's surface and ruled nearly a quarter of the, of the world's population. It was absolutely enormous. So when we think about the British Empire at the time of 1917, at the time of the Balfour Declaration, at the time of the British occupation of Palestine, we ought to think in terms of the United States dominance in the world today, and that the British domination at that point in time was something equivalent to that, uh, as you can see. It's also important just to looking at this map to recognize uh, some features of it in respect of the empire. Uh, for example, the extent to which uh, in 1919, after the First World War, uh, the British Empire stretched virtually from the north uh, of Africa, from Egypt, right down to the toe of South Africa, uh, all the way through the continent. Uh, and also, of course, India, which was a critical part uh, of the British Empire, Australia and New Zealand. So you can see how vast it was. And I want to draw emphasis and, and explain why that's important, because I think these things were components of the way in which Britain made decisions in respect to Palestine. Of course, they had a vision, uh, not, a, uh, not a vision, but a, a perspective for what they wanted to do in relation to Palestine. But it was premised on their imperial uh, objectives and their imperial priorities. And, and that included, for example, the fact that they wanted to maintain a form of uh, communication with the rest of the empire. Uh, vitally, they were exploiting India in particular with uh, all kinds of, in all sorts of uh, different ways in terms of trade. Uh, the British shipping, for example, in the world constituted more than 52% of the globes of the whole world's uh, shipping uh, entity. So you can see it was a, a colossally important. And as you can see from that map, if you look at uh, the area uh, here from the Mediterranean through the Red Sea, that was a vital communication line. So Suez was a critical point in that. And at the tip of the Red Sea, of course, Aden, another point of interest for the British uh, with the occupation in the very early part of the 19th century, 1830s, of uh, Aden itself. And all of that was really tied into ensuring that Britain had a viable a form of communication with the, uh, with the rest of the empire. So it's that kind of colossal sense of, uh, of the power that the British empire had that I think it's important for us to register in understanding that. And the third uh, component of this interest was the beginnings of uh, a commitment, or not a commitment, but the beginnings of a, an interest in the issue of oil. From the early part of the 20th century, the British were desperate to try and find um, sources of oil because they did not want to be dependent on the United States of America. And when they discussed these issues in the British cabinet in the First World War, uh, the question of having access and control over oil was considered to be a vital part of their strategy for the whole of the Near East, the whole of the Middle East, as, uh, as they called it. They wanted to be able to guarantee they had a source uh, for oil that they could draw on. Now, in addition to that, of course, uh, there were other countries uh, that were interested in, in, in gaining control in the area. 
And one of the things, if you like, to make the linkage is that those countries that were operative and in, involved in looking to intervene in the area are still the same ones that we see around today. Uh, we saw President Macron going to Lebanon. I don't believe for one minute that he was going to show humanitarian concern for the tragedy that happened in Beirut. I think it was much more that he wanted to kind of re-establish France's links as they see it with Lebanon as a part of their uh, kind of colonial sphere of influence. You see in Syria the intervention of um, various countries, including Turkey again, looking to uh, in intervene in that region. And of course, the United States of America, which although at the beginning of the 20th century was not directly involved, certainly expressed an interest. And as, a, as an interesting aside, if you like, at one stage, the British considered um, allowing the United States to have the mandate for Palestine because they were unsure whether they had the resources to sustain it. Uh, so you can see that all of these uh, international imperial powers uh, still today are hovering around uh, the region, intervening in the region, changing the governments, denying the people the right to uh, assert their own independence, their own autonomy, uh, to uh, ex express their right to self-determination in, in Iraq and, uh, and, and other parts of, of the Near East as a whole. Uh, the British Empire, as I said, uh, was one which was absolutely huge. And the debates within the uh, cabinet uh, that led up to the, the signing of the Balfour Declaration in 1917 expressed all of these kind of views and had all of these sorts of opinions. But I want to say from the outset, and this is one of the things that uh, I tried to present in my book, is it's very important that people appreciate that from the 19th century and through the early part of the 20th century, the Palestinians had a clear vision that they wished to exercise their right of self-determination. And they expressed it in various ways, in, in the Ottoman parliament, in newspapers that they had, uh, in, in a political organization that began to be formed and began to be shaped. And I say this because one of the kind of presentations that you have of the whole story of Palestine is that Palestinian national self-determination was really a response to uh, Zionism rather than being authentic, indigenous, and flowing from uh, the aspirations of the Palestinian people themselves. So I think it's important to say that, because I think it's important to have that sort of perspective. And in that respect, in relation to what uh, their aspirations included, it was very clearly the case that they wanted to um, uh, have a uh, area uh, of, that, uh, of that whole area independent. And this was the basis on which they conducted negotiations with the British uh, in, through the correspondence between uh, McMahon and Hussein. Uh, and this was a declaration that they made in 1915. In other words, well before uh, the Balfour Declaration, uh, the Arab peoples of the region had a view of what territory they wished to see independent. And this was contained in written form in the letters that were circulated, but you can, I hope you can see from the map uh, it, that it very clearly includes the whole of the Arab Peninsula. It includes all of Jerusalem, all of Palestine, all of Lebanon, all of Syria, and so on and so forth. There was no question that in their perspective, uh, and this is one of the sort of debates that comes up, it was for the independence uh, of the whole Arab region that they were campaigning and they were seeking uh, to establish. Um, in terms of the protocol itself, as I said, it was a very firm basis uh, on which uh, they were seeking uh, independence. But we know that the British continuously were intervening in this whole process, were seeking to create divisions uh, and to play a, a role in so doing. And of course, this came from their whole colonial experience. Uh, which we saw operating in other parts of the, of the globe and other parts of the world. Uh, and just to look at, uh, for example, uh, the uh, British cabinet um, that was uh, operating within uh, the, uh, uh, at the time, you can see some of the figures 
who were in the cabinet that took the decision uh, about the Balfour Declaration. I, usually at this point, if we've got a, uh, we, if we're meeting together, I hold a quiz just to ask which of these people you recognize. Um, usually the people at the top you can recognize or most people recognize fairly quickly. Uh, reading from the left, uh, David Lloyd George, uh, in, in the middle, Arthur Balfour, and to the right, um, Lord Milner. Uh, but along the bottom, these figures are uh, slightly less kind of clear as to who they are, and people are, remain unsure. But I think in some ways, they say a lot more about the politics uh, of the cabinet, the politics of Britain at the time, uh, and indeed the legacy that they, uh, they contributed. Uh, Lord Curzon was one, but um, further to that, uh, the gentleman, the second from the right, with the light grey beard, is Jan Smuts from South Africa. He was a member of the cabinet and of course was in a sense the progenitor, one of the progenitors of apartheid in South Africa. So the whole question of divide and rule and the way in which British imperialism operated uh, was very much part of his uh, vision of the world. Uh, the person to uh, the left of that uh, was a member of the a Labour Party, Henderson. Uh, so the Labour Party was a member of that cabinet because they supported the war effort uh, in 1914 and they joined in uh, the support for uh, the British effort. Uh, and he was party to that whole process. And the figure on the right, uh, I think, is one of the uh, real uh, ogres, I would consider personally, of this cabinet, uh, none other than Edward Carson. Uh, a leading political figure, uh, of course, who supported the uh, opposed strongly Irish independence, Irish home rule, uh, who was engaged in supporting the, the, the loyalists' uh, breakaway uh, and uh, the declaration of opposition to any form of home rule in Ireland. And of course, uh, also uh, on his CV is the fact that he was the barrister who prosecuted Oscar Wilde uh, when Wilde was being uh, you know, persecuted. But I think it's interesting because I think that cabinet says a lot about the kind of character of uh, the British imperial rule uh, and what they were about. There was opposition, of course, uh, very vocal opposition, uh, particularly from Edwin Montague, uh, the only Jewish member of the cabinet who was a Secretary of State for India, a very, very important post in, in the British kind of hierarchy of, uh, of positions. Uh, Montague uh, actually went so far as to completely condemn the proposal for the creation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, saying that it was uh, motivated by the British government's anti-Semitism, that what they were seeking to do was to create a situation where Jews would face further persecution because people would be saying uh, that they had a place to go to, therefore they should leave uh, and they should go out. And this is not somebody who, if you like, was an anti-imperialist, a revolutionary, or an, by any stretch of the imagination. He was a firm imperialist, but he believed that this was a completely uh, erroneous thing to do. And I think it's important to remember these debates and people who were involved in it, uh, because, uh, you know, at the present point in time, it's considered that you can't debate the political nature of the Zionist organizations, what their objectives were and what they were seeking to do. But here at this point in time, Montague was strongly opposed to what was uh, going on in the cabinet and said, in fact, that in his view, it was a minority of people uh, in the Jewish community in Britain who supported this whole notion and was strongly opposed to it. The British, however, steamrolled this through. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, from that point on, uh, the Palestinians were faced with a situation where they were under occupation. People talk about the mandate. I'm sort of slightly reluctant to use the expression mandate because it's presented as though it's a sort of neutral kind of role that the British were playing, somehow acting as sort of um, umpires or people who were kind of playing some kind of conciliatory role, trying to resolve the problems uh, as they perceived it. That wasn't I don't think a, a correct, or isn't a correct way, I don't think, of presenting it. This was an occupation, a military occupation. 
But as an occupation and as an act of colonialism that was taking place, I think it's important to recognize that it was not just about that physical domination and suppression of Palestinian ambitions and Palestinian rights, but it's about the way in which that role went on to distort and have serious impact on the political, social and economic character uh, that existed. Um, because what uh, took place was the, dis the way in which the economy developed was one that uh, disadvantaged uh, those areas of the economy which were predominantly uh, engaged or Palestinians were predominantly engaged with to advantage those which uh, the new Zionist uh, immigrants were engaged with uh, to create a situation in which critical sectors of the economy were actually uh, appropriated uh, and the Palestinians were denied the right to have control over them. For example, the Dead Sea uh, chemicals industry, which was beginning just at this point in time, but the World Bank reported just a few years ago that it's a colossal loss to the GDP, to the, uh, to the production of, of, of Palestine, somewhere in the region of 14, 16% of the GDP uh, as a consequence of the, uh, the denial of their rights to exploit that. So what we can see is that the colonialism of the British, the imperialism was not just about uh, a physical occupation and suppression, but was about intervening in the social and economic character of the country, in my view, in a way which inhibited and distorted the capacity of Palestine to actually construct its national campaign, its national objectives. Uh, we saw a shift, a decisive shift in the 1930s, and I'll, I'll draw my remarks to a, a close. In the 1930s, when there was a response uh, to Britain, a challenge to Britain. But here again, whereas in the early part of, of, of the British occupation, uh, it, the, the, there were objectives, 1930s, there were others that they were preoccupied with, like Italy's intervention in Abyssinia uh, and its takeover and the threat that they perceived that posed to the Red Sea actually um, being uh, uh, controlled by um, the, uh, the, the government. I want to just perhaps conclude by saying that all of these things um, which... Uh, I've been referring to uh, are still today part of the scenario that confronts the Palestinians. The way in which the fragmentation of Palestinian life took place as a result of the British occupation, the way in which it distorted the capacity of Palestine to organize, the way in which socially, for example, uh, people were displaced from the land as a result of the of the sale of land uh, that, that, that took place uh, and the way in which they were peripheralized and moved into precarious areas of the economy in such a way that the kind of social organization uh, that is vital to the constructing of a national perspective was actually inhibited by the British. So right the way through, what we see from Britain is an intervention in all aspects of, of Palestinian life in such a way that made that challenge even more difficult and we can see it's reflected today. I think it's vital that we talk about this, that we get out the message and understanding of this, not in order to feel guilty about what the British did in the past. We were not responsible for that, but in order to ensure that we are not complicit in that situation continuing for the future. So I think it's critically important that we recognize that just as with the campaign on Black Lives Matter, uh, the campaign for Palestine is about continuing the struggle against colonialism and imperialism and the denial of the Palestinian rights. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, that was fantastic. I, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do, which you just did, and, and, and in such a short time, because it's such a dense history. And having read your work, the one thing I forgot to do, which is this amazing book published by Verso, by Bernard about this period, which he spent a lot of time in the archives, but just uh, in order to not get lost in it, it's so dense and there's so many horrific uh, 
colonial betrayals and betrayals of trust and absolute uh, uh, abnegation of obligation, but also uh, just terrible lying to us. So, and, and, and the worst of it was they took the land under uh, and put it under the mandate. And that's one of the first questions. I have three questions. Maybe we can bundle them together if that's okay with you, because it kind of follows up on the things that you highlighted, which I think were really the key elements. And I'll even come to the, the gallery of villains that you have there because there's, it's endless. There's, there's another one, but you've kind of found the, and, and how much do we need to know? And I think that comes to the, to the final question, but the mandate, which the Balfour Declaration was inserted into, also had the uh, Article 22 and the Sacred Trust, which was about making sure that the peoples from those places would be free and had the right to their freedom and their right to self-determination. So inbuilt into it was already this colonial adventure as well as the promises and it was this i think it was sacred trust and i wanted to talk to you a little bit about the mandate itself uh i wanted to ask you about that but mostly also because while there was mandate in other countries they imposed and they imposed military and martial law at the same time uh there's uh, colonialism and you said colonialism and, and imperialism i'll get to the question i promise colonialism and imperialism is two sides of the same uh, coin, but I'd like to introduce the what another term here because we've got a lot of terms of what's going on today, uh, and we need to use a lot of them because there's quite an accelerated example of it, and that would be settler colonialism, because I think the the, and I wanted to ask you why you've chosen in a sense to put that definition aside. I mean I know you use it, and you know it's clear there's apartheid which is happening. But settler colonialism, it seems to me, also raises the issue of the forced uh, displacement, expulsion of the Palestinians and what was building up over the 20s and 30s and therefore the British police and army's response to destroy all resistance and claims for self-determination from the very beginning. So it's really about that language and what, how many words do you think we really need to use in order to explain what's going on today? And just touching that we're not living with a legacy, we're living with active colonialism. And so is settler colonialism helpful and why or why not? Or, you know, the terms of nationalism versus self-determination, etc. And the second uh, is about the education and the work in education and in schools and what parts of this are so absent and as you rightly said in uh, Black Lives Matter, everybody can see uh, the absence of basic history and how people grow up with fairy tales and how painful and difficult it is to be told these fairy tales aren't true. So really the education has to start in school so that people realize why there's a struggle, what justice would look like and actually change policy. And we know that needs to be done. So. One is about that question about, you know, of course the national curriculum must include colonial history and that's a campaign in itself. But there's the other side of the work that you did uh, in the 70s before I was in this country, in, in the 80s around uh, the unions. And I know PSC did a lot of these, they had education packs. And so it's not clear when this would happen, such a campaign to make ensure that colonial history is taught but also there's a lot of out of school activities and Saturday schools and evening schools. And the Palestinians did a lot of those because we had schools, UNRWA schools, and we had to have, you know, the scouts and everything and education outside the school in order to educate our young people. So it's about that as the second question. And the third is about, I mean, it just goes back to those words because I don't think it's a legacy in this case, because I think it's an existing settler colonialism that can be, uh, that needs to be stopped, but also uh, there is existing and active colonial projects. You know, if you look at the Middle East, if you look at Afghanistan and other places. And so it's like, I don't like very much the term diaspora because I think, you know, given our status legally, 
uh, under our inalienable rights as recognized by the UN. We're not really a diaspora yet. We're, there's these categories that aren't just categories. They're very important in terms of status about our inalienable rights that are maybe commonplace for, for, for people that know a lot about Palestine or that are active, but in a sense still has to be conveyed. So I think it was just two and a half questions. And I'm going to give it back. And I just want to say thanks so much for, oh, oh, the villains. That was the last bit. The villains. You know, we have this history of uh, in colonialism and empire and today, which is, you know, Colson was great. Colson is a villain. You know, it's, it's very upsetting that we have these things. I live in Oxford, so you can imagine everywhere, every street, you know, all that gallery. And actually, the young students here in the student society, Palestine Society, went into the archives and found out about these villains and found these very complex stories about them when they were young, before they went into the colonial service. But is it just to learn their role and the role that they played was villainous? Because... I'm thinking about a national education that's needed that goes beyond villainy because it's all of us. I mean, if it's going to be a progressive and emancipatory yeah. education, yeah. so I'll stop there. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah, it's uh, interesting what you were saying about Colston and um, the uh, Rhodes statue in Oxford, obviously. Um, <clears throat> I, was, I was looking up before we began uh, what statues there were that might be worthy of considering whether they should remain where they are. And uh, uh, there's, uh, there are statues of people like David Lloyd George uh, and Jan Smuts uh, and people like that. And uh, I think it would certainly be worth asking the question, you know, and of course, more importantly, in a sense, Winston Churchill, uh, asking questions about uh, those statues. I mean, I'm <clears throat> personally, I, I think that they should be preserved, but perhaps re removed from their places, but preserved in a way that explains to people who they were, what they did, what their significance was, and actually provides an opportunity, if you like, to engage with that uh, education that you were talking about. Um, and it seems to me that that's a, uh, an important thing that we should be talking about and thinking. So I, I think the whole question of education is, is vital. Um, what I'd I, I, this is a very kind of personal thing. I'm, I don't think education is, should be there to make people feel guilty because uh, current generations were not responsible for the actions of those who preceded them. And particularly when uh, we know that it was the ruling class that was carrying out these things. It was those with power uh, in those days. And it was not something endorsed, if you like, uh, by the population generally. Uh, but I do think we have a responsibility in terms of the complicity of the government uh, of the day uh, for continuing to stay quiet, uh, to not acknowledge the injustices that happened to the Palestinians and not to be forthright in supporting the rights of Palestinians for self-determination uh, and for rectifying the injustices that they suffered. If we are silent on that, then we are complicit, we are guilty of that. That is a different thing from saying we were responsible for slavery. We have to recognize it, understand it and analyze it, but also to challenge what, uh, the way in which it manifests itself in today's society. And that is the case, I think, with, uh, in relation to Palestine, the contracts that the British government has with arms uh, companies to do with, uh, uh, with Israel, companies who are profiteering out of the wall, profiteering out of the occupation and so on. All of those things, I think, uh, should be addressed uh, and should be part of a campaign that challenges that. I mean, going back to your first question on the on the issue of um, the colonial settler uh, using that terminology, I certainly do think that is an appropriate terminology. But I, I, I just want to qualify that by saying that the colonialism that took place in Palestine was different from some of the other colonial projects which the British had in a number of ways, in respect of countries like Australia, for example, where the indigenous people were literally uh, wiped out, were driven away, uh, but were not settled communities. Palestinian, the Palestinian society was really uh, very much integrated into uh, the more 
uh, you know, the European economy, the global economy. For example, wheat from Palestine was actually sold to London brewers to brew beer in the 19th century. Uh, oranges and fruit were exported to Britain. So there was a real developing economy and a real developing society that was existed in, uh, in Palestine, which was actually, in my view, destroyed uh, by um, uh, what happened and what took place uh, and, and actually distorted that. Uh, and the other thing about the, the, the settlers, uh, the Zionist settlers, was that unlike the colonial projects, let's say, of uh, the north of America, in the first instance, or Australia. These were not people who came from the imperial country itself uh, in the main. They were people who came from Eastern Europe and elsewhere. So they didn't have a loyalty or any kind of uh, umbilical cord that connected them to the imperial power in the same way. And in addition to that, the, the capital which they were able to import to develop uh, was actually not drawn from uh, the uh, in the main from Britain. It was drawn from uh, other parts of the world and it was drawn from the United States of America, for example. So this kind of uh, interrelationship between the colonial, the, the colonial settlers themselves and the imperial power didn't have that immediacy. And it was also the case that unlike other initial stages of colonial, colonialism, there was a national uh, project by the colonists themselves from the outset to create a state, to establish uh, you know, a state of their own, which was not the way in which things began uh, in other parts of uh, the colonial experience. So I think certainly colonial settlism was how we should define that. I, the thing that I, I think, and, and this is something I would, I would really like to explore a bit more, is whether or not that term has the same weight now, because um, Th that settlement has taken place, that country exists, uh, whether one agrees with you know, it having happened is a different question, but that country exists. So um, it, it, it's, it's an expansionist and aggressive, a repressive regime, which is actually suppressing Palestinian rights and so on. But I think it's almost got beyond uh, the status of a colonial settler. It's a colonial, it's an expansionist national entity that exists there. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of in a different phase of, of development, but notwithstanding that, the sort of actions that it is taking, the theft of land, the, 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 the way in which the Jordan Valley has been stolen, the way in which the settlements are expanding, uh, the way in which the rights of the Palestinians inside 48, inside the state of Israel are denied, what is happening to the people of Gaza, what is happening in the refugee camps, all of those things are as a consequence of its politics and its reactionary nature. So I certainly think that is, uh, you know, a development and a continuum from that, uh, the nature of what that re regime was and how it uh, was established. I think all of these things, and, and going back to the, the initial thing about the, um, the uh, uh, question of, uh, of legacy and so on. Um, le legacy, I mean, I, I, I'll try and not to be offensive, but there was a, 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 a the High Commissioner in, um, I just read a book by James Barr called Lords of the Desert. I don't know if you've read it. And there's a, a quote in there about the High Commissioner for uh, Aden, who before he was leaving said that uh, the only thing that the British uh, would have to leave as a memento uh, of their legacy uh, was association football uh, and the expletive F off. Uh, and that was all that they had to contribute that, that was their legacy. Sadly, I think that's uh, a, an underestimation of the consequences. It clearly is it, uh, still there, still quite significant. And I think we need to uh, develop education. Certainly, as you were saying, from the 1970s, um, we were involved in campaigning to raise issues of uh, international, uh, internationally what was happening uh, and, and, and the way in which countries were uh, developed. And they actually uh, were distorted and deformed by imperialist activity. So uh, people developed curricula uh, where they were actually talking about what was happening in countries like Brazil or uh, 
Cuba or other countries and what the consequences of that were. And I think that's the sort of thing we should be seeking to re-examine, particularly at this time when the whole question of the curriculum and what's happening in schools, the way in which examinations are conducted uh, are being uh, raised. And I think we should be looking to develop that kind of initiative. Thank you. Uh, I think we have come, I'm following orders here, uh, Bernard. So I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to come back to the role that you play and many people play within Palestine Solidarity Campaign in terms of disseminating, organizing, you know, working around this education and knowing how important it is to convey that history. So I'm sorry I caught you with, I have a list of words I don't like, legacy, you know, etc. But there's something about Palestine, which is a particular uh, account with British, with the British story of colonialism, which is ongoing. And we didn't get a chance to go over many of the aspects of your book, which go to, you know, many of the laws that they're using uh, about around the expulsion yeah. and, the, and the Nakba, but also the colonial practices that, that went right across from India, Ireland, Palestine, the same individuals on one side. Yeah. And we also didn't have time to talk about the resistance to it, which you have a good chapter on that early resistance to the project, this colonial I, yeah. project. Yeah. Yeah, so it's time, I think, for questions. And Bernard, um, did you want to say anything in closing, Bernard? Was there any last, because I kind of took the floor from you for the very last wind up, just a minute or two. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 on this issue of colonial settlerism, I, it doesn't change my critique of the actions of the Israeli government if I think that the, there is a question mark over the continuity of that, because I think it, it, it doesn't change my criticism of the way uh, they act, of the way they uh, treat the Palestinians, of the political kind of trajectory that they're going on. And clearly, uh, in the era of Donald Trump, we're seeing moves to uh, actually further weaken the potential of support in the Arab world for, for the Palestinians, with the UAE forming some sort of agreement with Israel and the potential for other parts of the Arab world doing that. And that whole nature of divide and rule, which we see continuing today is reflected in that. So if I have a, a question mark over the issue of whether uh, colonial, settlers, colonial settlerism uh, remains kind of, has the same kind of significance, it's not in any way to diminish any of the political critique that I would make of it from other colleagues and other people in, in, in the political world or the academic world who would use colonial settlement uh, as, as a terminology. It doesn't in any way kind of um, mean that I have a different perspective no. on what we should no. be doing campaigning wise, uh, the adamancy with which we should uh, champion the Palestinian cause and the way in which we should uh, uh, carry out that campaigning. So that it's, it's, a, it's a question of whether, uh, you know, the debate about, what is the situation there now uh, and how uh, that can be responded to with the utter fragmentation and the way in which that is throwing up new debates about perspectives in terms of how Palestinians should respond to that uh, is, a, is a question and a debate, I think, for another time, but is one that is there. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take some questions now. The first one is from Aisha and... It is on this very, of course, topic. Does British complicity in Israel's actions imply its colonial project continues by proxy? Uh, so, I mean, the short answer, I'll answer first and hand over to, to, to uh, Bernard. Um, and that, the short answer is yes. There is a continuing complicity I, I think beyond the complicity with the current arms sales and the current, it, it, I do think, you know, in, in a slightly different aspect of looking at settler colonialism as an expansionist project and looking at how it makes invisible and wants to destroy fragment, which we have now, the Palestinian people. It relies also on solidarity to take us back to that destruction, first of all, of our society, but the continued destruction of our society, which is happening everywhere, not just, uh, not, not, not alone in the West Bank or Jerusalem or Gaza or Lebanon or Syria or further afield where there's Palestinians. And I think 
it's that framing that people can understand this as a continuum because settler colonialism is about replacing and the project of the great Israel. So Britain has uh, been part of that settler colonial project from the beginning. And it really is the side that, you know, whereas today people are saying, well, we're, we don't really like colonialism anymore. Well, here it is. So people have a way to change current policy by pointing out that Britain is continuing a colonial project, not just in Palestine elsewhere, but it's the continuation of the denial of our right of self-determination and our right to return to our homes from which we were expelled. And the settler colonial project again can be seen in the first act, which was to destroy all the villages so we couldn't return because the UN resolution, of course, had it that all, all of us expelled from our homes and lands, yeah, of which we're the descendants, have the right to return home. But anyway, the question was, does British complicity in Israel's action imply its colonial project continues by proxy? And I was saying it's not by proxy, really, given Britain's particular history with Palestine. Bernard? Yeah, I, yeah I, I'd agree with that. I, I, I think that certainly remains the case. I, I think one has to be added to that is the role of the United States of America, mm. however. Um, essentially, I think in the 1950s, the role of British imperialism as the dominant force in the Near East came to an end with the Suez de Battle, uh, when the British and the French invaded Egypt, when President Nasser uh, nationalised the Suez Canal. And the Americans uh, took a different view and were opposed to it. Uh, and they, I think, ever since that date, essentially have displaced the British as the primary uh, imperial power in that region. And you can see that, obviously, today with their actions in Iraq, with their um, alliances with Saudi Arabia, with their intervention in Syria, uh, and uh, with their relationship with Israel. So I think Britain is still there, but it is kind of like a, uh, a lesser figure. Uh, but nevertheless given its kind of historic role, that remains something that has to be answered for. And the thing, one of the things that kind of I think about is, is that in a situation in which Britain is leaving the European Union, leave that aside as a separate debate, but that if Britain starts to go closer to Donald Trump, depending, of course, on the presidential election, is it going to be the case that uh, Trump is going to exact even more loyalty from the British for... America's foreign policies in respect of uh, the Near East region in relation to Israel and Palestine. In other words, is Britain going to finish up backing his so-called deal of the century, which we know is absolutely disastrous in terms of what would happen. So that's the only kind of addition that I would, that I would give to that. And of course, uh, one of the things we never talk about, and I don't think is, ever is talked about, but that is that Britain ought to be talking about reparations to the Palestinian people, because uh, after the Nakba 1948, a quarter of a million people driven from their homes and lands, all of those lands, I mean, they should be returned, of course, that's the first uh, point one would make, but there should be a restoration for that theft of, of, of capital, of homes, and so on. Uh, and we should be talking about reparations for the Palestinians, not just an apology. I agree, and I think that uh, notion, I'm going to... Uh, go through the next two questions I have because uh, actually they're, they're again relevant to what we're just talking about. Uh, one is uh, how do we compare colonial legacy in Palestine to its legacy elsewhere? And uh, the second is a question from Blake. Is it relevant to the Palestinian experience what Britain's motives were? I can imagine a Palestinian saying it doesn't matter. It is the fact of the denial of our self-determination that matters. We need a Palestine-centered perspective, not a British one. So I'm gonna answer that in reverse order and to say, unfortunately for us Palestinians, British history is Palestinian history by this brutal and violent uh, military force that came in 1917 when Allenby came into Jerusalem, turned, uh, imposed martial law, and started to destroy our polity. There is indeed, and in fact, there's a chapter in Bernard's book, but there's much work done on the Palestine, uh, Palestinians' response, resistance, 
creativity, ingenuity, the richness of our society, and how that continued in spite of exile, in spite of enforced, and, and continues until today in, in a way that we always continue to argue for their core principles of self-determination and return. So there's quite a lot of, but I think it's important we're in Britain, it's the British PSC, it is internationalism that we're talking about, but when we want to look at the history of the Palestinian people, it is fatally intertwined with British history. And I think that's one of the most important things that have come out from recent campaigning of a new generation is this understanding that it's not a history that was happening far, far away, but that in fact, British history is the colonial story. And so that's why it's not that it's not for me to be begging to be included in the national curriculum. It is the British story, is an imperial story, but it also is a colonial story which had lethal effects on a people that is ongoing. It's an ongoing emergency and crisis. Of course, I mean, to bring it to the legacy in other places, you know, there's something about this which has been imposed on us, which is very, uh, I would say, uh, imposed in a way to continue that kind of internalization of colonial activity, which breaks up, you know, one against another. And there's a apology, for, you know, there's, a, there's this great uh, campaign going for the Amritsar massacre and to get an apology and, and campaigning on that from Southall and other places. But I don't think it's slavery or, or the Amritsar. And I'm sure in a national curriculum, we couldn't cover the crimes. There'd be so many, we'd have to be in school for at least 30 years to actually understand all of the things that happened. But what unites that is a progressive anti-colonialism and internationalism that says, we must know what the previous generations did because all of us, all of us as internationalists have to solve this together. But once you know the facts of these generations, of the Nakba, of what happened in British colonial history and imperial history, Actually, it brings you to understanding what justice would look like. And I think that does involve reparations. And I think it does involve apologies, but it, it needs to be ta undertaken by, in a national way, both in this country and internationally. And of course, we had a lot of support and we continue to have a lot of support from the rest of the world in solidarity. You know, the people are with us and with our cause because of the ongoing colonial experience. So this is, that was Blake's, and then the colonial legacy, you know, the, the aspects I would say to that question, to compare it, there's something ongoing now. That I'm not saying that there's very heavy, costly legacies in countries across the world yeah. uh, from, the, from the colonial, and reparations and understanding and realizing how they destroyed those societies and continents even and left it in the way we see it today and the way people are overcoming and the brilliance is incredible. So I'm not saying the legacies don't have immediate effect and impact, but there's something distinct about the sovereignty of Palestine and what was taken from us by the British and given away or stolen really. That means that the legacy is uh, an active colonial situation which gives a rationale of, of collective action. Yeah, to respond to it. it. It was interesting. One of the things um, working on the book was looking up uh, the anti-colonial uh, colonial struggles that were taking place. And it was interesting to look at the extent to which people engaged in those struggles actually related to each other. Uh, for example, I read a whole account about how um, the... Uh, Indian uh, community in New York organized uh, an annual uh, kind of festival uh, to celebrate Indian independence when they were campaigning for it. Uh, and they had as some of their principal speakers, uh, speakers from Ireland, uh, and they talked obviously uh, about the fight that the Irish were involved uh, against uh, British uh, imperialism uh, and the activity that they were taking. And in Ireland, there was a debate in the, 19, the end of the 19th century among some of the parties to actually stand uh, Indians 
in constituencies in Ireland where they would get elected so they would have a voice inside the British Parliament. So what is very clear is that those who were the victims of imperialism, who were suffering from the colonial impression, actually understood each other's uh, concerns and had that sense of solidarity. So I think you're right in saying that I think, in a sense, um, I won't say it doesn't matter, but it's the methodology, it's the way in which imperialism operated, it's the way in which colonialism functioned, the way in which it, it uh, denied people's rights and people's lives, uh, that it's important. And uh, there are many examples that one could find, but one could do it in a way that demonstrated its applicability to other conditions, other circumstances, other situations. And I'm sure, uh, you know, that we could do that. And of course, uh, the question of the legacy of British imperialism, of course, is still there today. Um, you know, Ireland is not united, full stop. Uh, it was, uh, of course, you could look back, actually, and say that the origins of um, the situation in Ireland were in part as a result of colonial settlers uh, being brought in by the British in the north of Ireland to uh, displace the most rebellious uh, of, of the Irish, fighting against the English at the time, uh, and the splitting of, uh, of, of, of Ireland uh, was, you know, a deliberate uh, strategy that they involved in. Cyprus, another example where division was brought in. South Africa, another example. So, the, as you say, the, the, the legacy is still there. It's still very much present. And of course, the, you only have to look at the situation in Australia, uh, the position of the indigenous peoples, the First Nation of Australia, the First Nations of Australia, and the way in which they have uh, suffered as a result of uh, British imperialism, British colonialism. So uh, the legacy is not, a, it's very sharp and very distinct and critical in terms of Palestine, but it is clearly there in other areas of the world too. I mean, we've got our last question. I've had a few emails saying this is the last and we're going to close now. And uh, it goes on the map making because it's about the United Arab Emirates. Because the other thing British did, the British did everywhere was make these lines yeah. and set people against each other and break up peoples and all kinds of terrible criminal and separate. You know, they talk about this a lot when you look at enslaved people and how they would se separate families. The way that that's ongoing today in so many parts of the world, the colonial practices that come out of those boundaries and those borders that were made. But this last question says it's a good question to end on, so I think we're going to end on this one, which is how do we resist the normalization of ties with Israel, especially after the UAE deal? And uh, from my side, I'm not going to say this isn't important, what I would say matters is this kind of responsibility which goes beyond uh, protesting for those that care. And that's what, uh, why this history is very important because this cause and this struggle will go on and the Palestinians will continue to struggle for their rights and we will continue until we achieve them. Now, the role in and what we, we, we stand with and so many people stand with us is to convey this story. You know, whatever was signed there to normalize doesn't uh, change the fact. If Unless they wipe and make it disappear in the news, we've seen that with Gaza. So the voice and conveying these stories, which people may say, oh, I know this history, I don't wanna go over this history, but actually it's essential because we're so, they, we're so dehumanized in the press, we're made so invisible, and as if it doesn't matter if it's a game, as if it's somewhere else. And the actual story of what's going on every day, just behind the headlines and the screens, and as I said, the many, many days, this was not covered in the mainstream press. I know a lot of people don't rely on it anymore, but still it's a battle that we cannot give up the mainstream press, because it needs to be a concerted effort to achieve justice for us. And the more that it becomes, you know, something that's a specialist knowledge of people that care, the role of solidarity I see here again is conveying these to others and to make this a shared understanding of what's going on and why this won't work, why this won't work and why we need justice. So that's uh, 
that's in a sense where I think I'll close, but I, I'm going to ask Bernard to say uh, the final word on that. And thank you for, for coming. I mean, clearly, what we see at the present point in time is an aggressive policy operated by the Israeli government, which is continuing to repress the Palestinians. And we're seeing with the move of Donald Trump to endorse the building of the settlements, the expansion of the settlements, the theft of land, we're seeing that actually being pushed through. And it does, I think, cause grave concern that that is something which is uh, actually there on the agenda and is, is being presented and that countries like the UAE, the UAE and other countries in the region are talking about entering into negotiations uh, with Israel. Uh, the UAE claiming that they had stopped the deal of the century and the uh, appropriation of additional land by, uh, by the State of Israel, which of course is completely untrue. Uh, Israel will ignore that. And yet we're seeing other uh, countries in the region like Oman and others talking about engaging with the, with the Israelis. And what worries me is that the situation will become to be accepted. The, the notion of normalization is what is becoming the dominant sort of uh, discourse, if you like, that these things are uh, part of the landscape and something that we should accept. And I think it's clearly incumbent on us uh, not only to tell the truth about what has happened in the past, but what is happening today. And to alert people to this gross injustice. <laughs> when apartheid was defeated in South Africa, I always say there were three components. One was the struggle of the black majority in South Africa. Uh, the second was a weakening of the position of the white ruling class who came to the conclusion they couldn't continue as they had done. But the third component of that was the international solidarity, which was built that had pressure that brought to bear. And that's why I think the campaign for boycott, disinvestment and sanctions is something that we have to bring forward all the time. I think we have to put pressure on the British government and to build a mass campaign in this country, which is actually going to unite people, bringing the whole of the student movement together, the whole of the trade union movement together, the mass of society to assert the rights of the Palestinian people and to give solidarity and support because without a doubt the Palestinians themselves showing incredible courage and continuing to be steadfast in their resistance to what they have suffered as a result of the policies of the Israeli government. I think there is a responsibility on us to educate ourselves, to educate others and to engage in an active way in campaigning and building a mass united campaign in the same vein that the anti-apartheid movement was that has the impact of forcing the British government not just to apologize or give reparations but to be an active supporter of Palestine, Palestine in fighting for its right to self-determination. Thank you. Thank you so much Bernard. I was very 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 moving and uh, I've heard you many many times over the years but this is a very nice opportunity to look both at the work that you did uh, recently in all of this research, but also the history of your own organizing, which comes from that internationalist position and internationalist stance. And so it's very opportune that we're on a PSC platform because those are the principles that Palestine Solidarity Campaign has always stood for. Internationalist, progressive, anti-racist, and trying to build a broad coalition right across society because this is something that every British child and adult needs to learn about and know about so that we can get towards, closer towards justice in our struggle. So thank you, Bernard. That was just a lovely evening and very informative. Thanks so much. You've been listening to the Palestine Podcast, a production of the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.ipsc.ie forward slash podcast. For more news, analysis, events, and ways in which you can take action, see our website at www.ipsc.ie. Thank you for listening, and you'll be hearing from us again soon.